Okay, everyone. Thank you all for coming to this Wild Wednesday. Um, uh, I'm excited to get to introduce you all to Goliath State Park. Um, it is a beautiful state park. Um, and Emily is going to be our guide to this amazing park, which has which is rich in history and beautiful nature. Um, so without further ado, I would like to introduce our uh, guide to Goliad. Emily, would you like to take the floor? Absolutely. Hello. I'm happy to be here. Um, I'm the lead interpreter of Goliad State Park and Historic Site. Um, I love my job. I have, I really lucked out. I tell everybody I hit the jackpot when I got here. Um, I'm, you know, of course, love our park and I'm really excited to share it with y'all. So, all right. So that's a picture of our mission here at Goliad State Park and Historic Site. Um, we, we are a historic site. We have quite a bit to see um, from the historical aspect. Of course, we also, um, as mentioned earlier, we have a lot of nature to share as well. Uh, we have a lot to do here. So our site is very unique with our staffing. We actually have a full interpretive team. So uh, I have two other full-time interpreters and a part-time interpreter um, here at our park. Most parks, if they're lucky, they have an interpreter. Uh, we are unique in that we have several. So this kind of shows where we are located. Um, we're not directly next to any major hubs. Uh, we are a little under two hours from San Antonio, about two, two and a half hours from Austin, about two, two and a half hours or so from Houston. Uh, it makes a good day trip from those major hubs. Uh, we're only about an hour or so from Corpus. Um, so a great day trip. Um, we also have a lot of campers. So a lot of people come in from those big hubs, but because we're not located right next to one, we tend to be a little bit um, more relaxed. We don't have big crowds. Uh, we're not really known as being a party park. We're more of a laid back, um, you know, good for families. We have a lot of winter Texans. Um, our peak season is not in the summer. <laughs> we're in South Texas. It's hot, it's humid. Um, so our peak season is fall through the spring. and um, even during the busier weekends, um, we tend to be still a little bit less busy than other places. So if you're looking to get kind of away from the crowds, we're a great option for that. So here's a map of our park. Uh, there's a lot going on here. We have several sites that you can see within the, the grounds. Um, specifically to see just on this map, all within some, most of its walking distance, depending on your ability, um, but we have Mission Espiritu Santo, that's the med major you know, piece that everybody comes to see. Uh, we also have the El Camino Real de los Tejas Visitor Center, which is located just outside of our park on the other side of the highway. Um, yeah, right there. So that there's no walking trail to that site. Uh, we do suggest that you drive um, to that site because you're crossing the highway, but it's a very, very quick drive. Um, you won't even have time for the air conditioner to kick on before you get there and you can go inside. Uh, further down across the river is the birthplace of General Ignacio Zaragoza. You can walk to that site. There's a hike and bike trail that will take you to it. It's located directly across from Presidio La Bahia. Presidio La Bahia was, um, kind of a, it was in a partnership with Mission Espiritu Santo. So they were both operated originally by the Spaniards. And so today the mission is part of our state park. Presidio La Bahia is owned by the Catholic church. So it doesn't show up on our map because it's not our site, but it's there right across from the birthplace of General Ignacio Zaragoza. Um, not immediately pictured on this up in the corner where it says Mission Rosario. Mission Rosario is a remote site that you do have to drive to. It's about a five, mile, uh, five minute drive um, down the highway. So that one's gonna be the farthest um, location to get to that's associated with our park. But most of our park is accessible um, either by foot, by bike or very, very short car rides. Um, so if you're not looking to do a whole lot of driving while you're at the parks, again, we're, we're a good option for that. 
So here's a map of our mission grounds. The mission grounds are divided up between parts that have been restored and parts that are still in a ruinous condition, and then other parts that you can't see but we know used to exist. So parts that you can walk through today are one, two, and six. So that's the church, the granary, and the workshop. Um, today, the granary is actually a museum and it's air conditioned. And I'll say that again later. <laughs> One of the best things about our park, I think, um, being in South Texas where it's hot most of the year, we have a lot of sites that are air conditioned. So that's great for everybody. Um, the priest quarters are in ruins and it gives you a really good um, kind of feel for what was left here of the site originally after the Spaniards left, it fell into ruin, you know, it, it, so that's original wall that was constructed mostly in the 1750s. Um, so you, you really get a good feel for the history. Some of those stones, you can still see the chisel marks in them. Um, so we have a really good mix of restored or an original um, stuff here on our grounds. So this used to have some text on the side, but the Civilian Conservation Corps uh, was key in our park. They came in and did the restoration of the park. Uh, judge White, he was the county judge here in Goliad um, back in the 1930s. So he recognized the importance of the mission here in Goliad and the Presidio. And he really wanted to um, kind of boost the, um, um, the ability to see these, these sites. So back then, um, you had the Alamo, you had, you know, San Jacinto, they were uh, being advertised, they were open to see, but Goliad wasn't. So Judge White requested that the CCC come in and do the restoration at the mission <clears throat> while that was an option. So um, he was able to, to get that. The CCC did come in in the 1930s and um, they, they did the restoration of the church and the granary and the workshop. Um, they did some incredible work here. So of course, the CCC is well known for um, doing amazing things, making very pretty, you know, beautiful buildings. Here, they had a different uh, beast to tackle. They weren't just creating something new. They were recreating um, something very old. So to do so correctly, they had to learn how to do some of these techniques. These uh, boards were all hand hewn. They were um, Often these guys were, they had, a lot of them had worked on the railroads, so they were experienced with broad axes and they put that experience to work, but they had a lot of new skills to learn as well. Um, the stone work, uh, using kilns to create lime mortar. I mean, they had a lot of those older techniques that have been phased out. You know, our technology got better. Well, the CCC guys had to go back and actually rebuild it to the same specs from the 1750s. So they had a lot of learning to do. Um, most men of the CCC were young guys, about 18 to 25 years old. That wasn't the case at our park. Uh, there were a few veteran groups in the CCC. So one of ours, or the, the company that came to our park was company 3822V. So they were veterans of most of them, World War I, Spanish-American War, but also the Boxer Rebellion and a couple other little skirmishes. Um, so these men were about 40 to 55 years old which uh, I'm assuming helped because they had a little bit more patience than some of the younger guys might have had. Um, so they're able to do some of those intricate, you know, detailed things that you can't rush through. Um, interesting to note was the architect in charge of this project. His name was Rayford Stripling. He was in his 20s when he showed up here. He was a young, young guy and, um, you know, given charge of these older guys who had had experience. And so, Mr. Stripling had to really quickly kind of establish himself as being knowledgeable and, and experienced, and, you know, somebody to uh, to listen to and follow. But he did that, and his men respected him and did a lot of great things under his leadership. So, Mr. Stripling, uh, he was a trained architect, but he also understood that he had some more training to do before he came here. So, before any work was really started on the mission. He actually went down into Mexico and all the way out to California and looked at every piece of Spanish architecture he could get his hands on, particularly looking at those Spanish missions and presidios, trying to get a really good feel for how he needs to reconstruct Mission Espiritu Santo. You know, what 
would have absolutely been there, what might have been there, what would not have been there. So a lot of homework, a lot of effort went into this. Um, thank goodness, because it's just beautiful today. So Mission Espiritu Santo, the history behind this building, it was first established in 1722 on Matagorda Bay. And that was that site was chosen because it was actually the site of La Salle's Fort St. Louis. So when this whole area was New Spain, back before it was Texas, it was all Spanish territory. Well, France had claimed Louisiana. La Salle was supposed to go find the Mississippi River. He missed it and ended up at Matagorda Bay instead. So he established a fort there in New Spain. So Spain was really upset that this French guy had come over and you know had established his own fort in their territory. So when they found out about it, um, that fort was very short lived, but the Spaniards wanted to go um, remove that fort. So the, the orders were given to find the Fort St. Louis, burn it all the way to the ground and construct the Presidio and uh, mission at that site. So the Presidio, its purpose was to house the Spanish soldiers and protect the land. The purpose of the mission was to create Spanish citizens. So to hold new Spain, for Spain, you needed people there to do that. So instead of sending their own people from Spain over, Spain decided let's take the people who already know how to live in this area, the Native Americans, we'll just turn them into Spanish citizens. So that was the purpose of the mission. So they found Fort St. Louis, they burned it all the way to the ground and they constructed the Presidio right on top of that site and the mission right across the creek. So this is up a creek called Garcitas Creek um, down again, on Matagorda Bay. Uh, they didn't stay there a whole long time. Um, conditions are pretty rough down there and they had to move in 1726. They moved to Mission Valley closer to Victoria. And then they did pretty well there for a number of years. But then in 1749, the mission was moved to Goliad. And the decision for that was made based on its proximity to uh, El Camino Real, the King's mm -hmm. Highway. And so the El Camino Real was kind of the first major road that ran through this area. It connected Mexico with East Texas and California. And so having the mission on the road gave them better access to trade. They could move soldiers around. Um, it just made more strategic sense. So in 1749, the building was placed here in Goliad. It's um, up on a hill, which is important to note. Um, there is kind of a hill to get up um, to the mission. We are working on hopefully getting some um, kind of assistance to help some people get up this hill. But um, as of right now, it's just a sidewalk. So um, if you have some mobility issues, um, take that into account. Um, so, but the mission is up on a hill. We're also nearby a rock quarry. You can see the original quarry from the nature trail that we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, there's a lot of good hardwood trees in the riverbed, um, and of course the river. So the San Antonio River uh, kind of cradles our whole park and it runs very close to Mission Espiritu Santo. Uh, however, that river being good for freshwater, it was not good for irrigation because it's a very steep banked river. So if they were gonna try to create a dam to bring the water level up and irrigate fields, well, they had to build a huge dam um, to, to stop that water. So their dams kept failing. So instead of focusing on irrigating crops, they turned their focus to their cattle. So back with the first Spanish explorers, they were kind of dropping cattle off throughout New Spain and uh, those cattle went feral. And the lands that the mission owned, uh, those lands stretched all the way up to Floorsville. Um, so it was like a million and a half acres that this mission claimed. On all that land, there were about 40,000 head of cattle. So the 40,000 head uh, was kind of really the wealth of the mission. Um, Spain didn't want to continuously you know, give money to the mission. So the mission needed to be self-sufficient. So with a huge cattle ranch like they had, they had the, the means to trade you know, for crops with San Antonio. Um, they could pay people to come in with cattle products um, and do certain Things. So essentially the cattle was their wealth. Uh, they had to be very skilled with these cattle because they were not nice cattle. They were feral, they were um, skittish. And so you have a lot of these new ranching techniques that come about through this mission, trying to round up brand um, and slaughter cattle. So this was the first major cattle ranch in Texas. 
Um, as the, the mission prospered with the cattle herd, it was doing all right. But then again, Spain didn't want to keep putting money into the mission. Well, then at one point they wanted to start making money from the land. And so they looked to those cattle that were roaming all throughout New Spain. They decided that they can make their money from those cattle. So there was an act put into place that uh, made all the unbranded livestock in Texas property of the crown of Spain. And so with that act, the mission herd was essentially cut from the 40,000 head down to 15,000. But a lot of poaching started going on. So within about seven years, 30,000 cattle were poached from mission grounds. And um, because the, the cattle was their wealth, when you start to lose wealth, then you start to see the decline of the mission. And so buildings started to fall into ruin. They couldn't afford to feed everybody. And you start to see the mission uh, population dwindle. Um, they were doing pretty poorly in you know, the kind of late 18, well, about 1820 to 1830, they were really doing bad. Um, there was a call for secularization that had occurred in 1794. That was where they were going to divide the land up of the mission and hand it out to the Spanish, new Spanish citizens, the Native Americans that had been turned into Spaniards. They were supposed to divide that land up, but that never happened because um, when, when 1794, when that request was given, the priests at our mission said, we're not ready, so um, give us an extension. So they were given a five-year extension and then another. And so from 1794 until 1830, um, those secularizations didn't happen. 1830, that was kind of the final, Spain said, you're, you're done, you gotta go. So uh, the, the mission was secularized in 1830, but by that point, it was actually already abandoned. Um, the priest was no longer at this site. The Native Americans that were here were not being given instruction. Um, it was pretty much done already by 1830. Um, so El Camino Real de los Tejas Visitor Center. This visitor center has, historically has been known as the Hacienda, the Keeper's Cottage. Um, it's had a few different names, but this building was constructed by the same CCC company that restored the mission. Um, this was kind of their practice place. So they had to build a house for the caretaker of the state park. Once we, had, you know, we knew that we we're going to make a state park, now you need a place for that person to live. So the CCC decided. Um, let's practice what we're going to take over to the mission here at this building. So this one wasn't supposed to be open to the public, being a private home, and um, so it made perfect sense to them. Let's let's get all of our mistakes out of the way on this building, and um, you know perfect our techniques to bring to the mission. Um, so this this is a really interesting building from an architectural standpoint. And this is Zaragoza's birthplace. So uh, General Ignacio Zaragoza, he led the Battle of Puebla, which is um, the battle that uh, we celebrate Cinco de Mayo um, over or about. So on May 5th, 1862, the French forces were coming in through Veracruz and were trying to get to uh, Mexico City. To get to Mexico City, they had to first take um, Puebla. Puebla stood in between Veracruz and Mexico City. There we go. So this building had a revamp um, a couple of years ago. So this is what it looks like today. Um, and the inside was done all nicely as well. Uh, very neat, clean, nice looking displays. So Ignacio Zaragoza, his father was stationed at the Presidio uh, that's directly across the street from this building. Um, so he was born into this house. He was only here for a few years before he and his family moved uh, back into Mexico. But um, his family wanted him to go into the clergy. They wanted him to kind of be a, you know, have a religious, um, religious employment. And uh, he didn't want that. He wanted to go into the military like his dad. And so that's where he went. And he was very successful. And at a you know, pretty young age, he won that Battle of Puebla that he was not supposed to win. Um, he was up against, at the time, the French army was the most feared army in the whole world. Um, so he, Zaragoza, was outnumbered, outgunned, um, outskilled. You know, these guys that he was fighting against for professional soldiers. The soldiers that Zaragoza had on his side, often they were uh, volunteers or they had never seen battle before. They were farmers. Um, so they were outnumbered and 
again, we're not supposed to win. Uh, Zaragoza kind of admitted, you know, quietly to his officers that you know, we're probably not going to make it out of this one. But um, as uh, Zaragoza continued in his um, military career, he he progressed very quickly and um, at the culminated with the Battle of Puebla. So again, not supposed to win. He's telling his his officers we're not going to get out of this potentially, but he told his men. Your foes are the foremost soldiers of the world. You are the first sons of Mexico. And that speech really kind of drove up uh, the morale of the soldiers. And they did go on to uh, push back the French forces a few times until France finally turned tail and ran. Um, they did come back the next year. They ended up taking Mexico City. And by that point, unfortunately, Ger General Zaragoza had died. Zaragoza was so dedicated to his troops that when they were ill with typhoid, he wouldn't leave them. He went back and um, was, you know, with them and ended up also um, dying of typhoid. So he was a just an incredible person, um, very, very dedicated to his career. An interesting tidbit about him, he was so dedicated to his military career that he missed his own wedding. <laughs> He uh, was in battle and his brother had to stand proxy for him at his wedding. So inside of this building, you can read all about his history, how, you know, how he grew up, um, what kind of led him through his life to, um, to what he's known for today. So really interesting bit of history there with Ignacio Zaragoza. So this is Mission Rosario. Mission Rosario was constructed to be kind of a sister mission for Mission Espiritu Sancho. Uh, this mission was mostly set aside for the Karankawa. Uh, there were two kind of major groups in the area. You had the Aranama and the Karankawa, several others that kind of fell into one or the other. So Mission Espiritu Santo housed mostly Aranama and Mission Rosario was for the Karankawa. They couldn't be housed together. They had very different cultures. Um, it's just better off for everybody to separate them. And so Mission Rosario was constructed in hopes of bringing Karankawa in. However, the mission was a little bit too far inland for their tastes. Um, the Karankawa didn't want to stay here. So um, Mission Rosario was not as long lived as Mission Espiritu Santo. Um, Espiritu Santo actually is the longest running mission in Texas. Um, it lasted about 109 years. So Mission Rosario was much shorter lived than that. Um, it was constructed, uh, the Karankawa came in and then they abandoned it. And then they requested a few years later that it be um, constructed and reopened. And so eventually it was uh, reopened and then eventually abandoned again. So this site is, is very, unique from the the standpoint of Spanish missions. It's not a cookie cutter mission. It's actually kind of a mystery. We don't know exactly what some of these buildings are for, what there's one wall that has us really scratching our heads. So there are a lot of questions about this mission, but the timeline, it was built in 1754. It was abandoned uh, for the first time in 1781. And then they came back in 1789 and reopened it. And then by 1808, it had been uh, closed because Mission Refugio, Refugio um, had opened. So Mission Refugio was a little bit further towards the coast where the Karankawa preferred to be. So these two missions, Rosario and Refugio, they kind of got combined. So Rosario was closed in favor of Refugio. And so today, what we have is the original stone ruins back from, you know, this is just what's left after they left it in 18, 1808. Um, so most of these stone structures date back to about the 1750s. Um, so a very unique like I said, site to see. Um, you cannot access it directly. You, there's a fence around it. You can go and, and look at the ruins um, through the fence, but there is a plexiglass cutout that's really neat. You can line up the plexiglass with the site and you can kind of see an artist's rendition of what the site used to look like fully restored. Presidio La Bahia, it is not part of our park. So I wanna get that established, it's not, not ours, um, but we do send 
people over as, as often as we can. Um, the two sites, again, played the same kind of, they, they were looking for the same goal, it was the same people um, kind of operating both, but they did operate independently. So you have a, the captain at the Presidio in charge of running the Presidio, and then the priests at the mission in charge of running the mission. Um, but they, they cooperated, of course, it was a, it was a partnership. Um, we try to maintain that partnership today. So the state park and the Presidio, we try to um, work with each other as much as we can with events and other things. Um, so the Presidio and Mission Complex is, is, it's really cool that we have both because it's the only instance in Texas where we have a, a standing Presidio and a standing mission um, together. So you can see them both. Um, the Presidio is well known for the Battle of Goliad. Um, Colonel Fannin and his men, th this whole chapter in history happened after um, the mission was abandoned, after the Presidio was done as a Spanish fort. So then Fannin came in and took the fort, fortified it you know, as his own, renamed it Fort Defiance. And um, that's where all the Texas Revolution stuff started. So Fannin, um, was asked to come and help the rest of the Texian army. Um, Sam Houston asked him to come and help. He, uh, Fannin kind of dragged his feet. He left a little bit late and um, was caught nearby at Coloto Creek, um, was surrounded by the Mexican army and was marched back to the Presidio. They were housed at the Presidio for about a week. Um, then Santa Ana gave the orders to execute um, all of the prisoners. So. Bannon's men were then marched out in different directions. Um, a lot of the men thought they were going home. They didn't know what was awaiting them, but the Mexican army uh, marched back and kind of became parallel with the with Bannon's troops and they raised their rifles and fired upon the men. So a few men did escape. We have some accounts of what happened because of the uh, survivors, but now today it's known as the Goliad Massacre. and um, the site is very popular to visit for, for both chapters in history, you know, as a Spanish fort and um, its role in the Texas Revolution. Um, our chapel here at the park is not active. The Presidio Chapel is active. Um, they still have mass every Sunday. The uh, Presidio is actually run by the Catholic Church, the Victoria Diocese. So um, it's, you, you know, if you're looking for an active church, this is, um, it's a really neat place to see. They, they welcome visitors to come and join them at mass. Uh, the Presidio also has quarters available for rent. You can sleep in them overnight. Uh, they do book up pretty quickly. So uh, if you're looking to stay in the quarters, you can get onto uh, the Presidio La Bahia's website and there's an option through their website to book the quarters. A lot of people who are booking these quarters do so because it has a reputation of being haunted. I've heard some pretty crazy stories uh, coming from people who had stayed at the Presidio. Um, so especially if you're into ghost hunting and that kind of thing, um, this is an incredible experience. So the camping at our park, we have um, a few different options. This pictured here is one of our pull through uh, full hookup sites. So our full hookup sites are all pull through. They all of course have sewer and water and electric. Um, they have 30 and 50 amp electric. They, um, the pull through sites are nice, especially for people who aren't comfortable backing their rigs in. Um, you never have to back up uh, in the Karankawa loop. So Karankawa loop has all these uh, full hookup sites. They also have screen shelters and we'll look at a screen shelter here in a minute. Uh, we also have sites that are electric, but no sewer. Those are in the Hikali's loop. Um, the Karankawa sites fill up a little faster than the Hikali's loop, um, but there's a dump station in Hikali's. So if you're staying for a short distance um, or for a short time frame, then uh, most people are, are just fine using that dump station. And then we also have a number of sites with water hookups only. There are our tent camping sites, most of them are located down closer to the river. Um, I do want to kind of say that it's a steep banked river. Those sites down by the river um, may not be best for people with toddlers who kind of take off running. Um, 
So keep that in mind if you are booking a site um, for people who are old enough not to tumble into the water, they're great sites, but just keep that in mind. Um, they are close to the river and it is steep banked. So here's one of our screen shelters. Uh, these are not air conditioned, they're screened in. Um, you can sleep inside of the shelters or you can have a tent outside. You can keep your food inside of the shelter. Uh, there's a picnic table inside of each one. Um, we do get quite a bit of a breeze kind of throughout the year. So um, they're not very often just kind of stagnant, you know, inside of these shelters, the, the air does circulate pretty well in there. Um, so a nice uh, retreat in the summertime. Um, they're they're very handy because you don't have to worry about zipping up all your food, and making sure it's all you know raccoon proof. You can just put it all in the shelter and shut the door, and you're good. So the shelters are pretty popular. Um, if you're looking to rent one, I would I would look a little bit in advance. Here's the group dining hall. Um, we're going to talk about weddings in the chapel, but we often have people come in wanting to do weddings. The group dining hall is an awesome area for a reception or just kind of a base camp for those weddings. But the group dining hall is also rented out by other large groups, um, scout groups, family reunions, um, anything that you want a little bit more, um, more amenities for your camping trip. So this group dining hall has a fireplace. It has a large um, stove with, uh, it's a gas stove and an oven. I've used it before, it's wonderful. Um, it is air conditioned or heated in the, in the winter time. There are bathrooms. So the bathrooms for the Hakali's Loop are, um, so um, the group dining hall, there are bathrooms for Hakali's attached to the back of the dining hall. So you will have people kind of walking back and forth um, by the windows. Um, but you know, that's, that's just how it is. <laughs> and then on the other side of this building, there's a large fire pit that was constructed by some Boy Scouts. Um, it, there are nice oak trees on both sides that, that cover those picnic tables. So the group dining hall is a very comfortable um, place for those larger gatherings. So here's the chapel decorated for Christmas. Um, again, for weddings, we do get requests to book the chapel. Um, and you can see there it's $250 for two hours. You get, you can come in and decorate. There are some restrictions to, uh, you know, what you can use to decorate. You can't um, use adhesives or, you know, things like that. Um, anything that's going to kind of stick to the mission, you can't do that. But anything you're just going to set down and then pick back up, you're welcome to decorate the chapel. Um, we have plenty of electricity running to the chapel. Um, there's uh, the water. We actually had a pipe first um, on the mission grounds. So we had to shut water off to the mission grounds, but just outside of the wall, we do have a, a spigot there with a hose. So we have some water available uh, if you do need it. Um, the closest restrooms though now are down in headquarters, which is down that hill. So it's something to keep in mind. It's not a far walk, it's just a hill. Um, the chapel rental covers up to 25 guests. Um, anybody that you have over that, um, you can pay for them up front or you can have your guests um, pay as they come in. If it's kind of a no RSVP thing, you know, you can let us know who you expect and, and we'll do our best to, to work with you on everything. Um, the, the chapel can be rented for other purposes, but weddings is by far the, the biggest hit. Um, it's not an active chapel. And I'm gonna say that a couple more times because we get that question all the time. But um, people are welcome to bring in their own, um, you know, people for a religious ceremony. You can you can do what you want inside of the chapel. We're not going to tell you you can't. Um, but it's not exclusive use of the chapel. So people could come in, um, you know, during your wedding or whatever event you're having. People are people can come into the chapel and see it. Um, but I will say that I've never heard of any issues coming from that. Most people are very respectful they'll notice something's going on through the front doors and they either won't come in or they'll just come in and be very quiet. So, um, you know, it's kind of luck of the draw as to what kind of guests you have coming in um, during your, your ceremony. But um, as I said, I've, I've never heard of anything going wrong. No, no disruptions, anything like that. Uh, but it makes a beautiful uh, background 
for a wedding and you know things are getting expensive and this is a pretty cheap option uh, for those weddings so uh, we're excited to see more people coming in now post COVID we've got some more bookings on the calendar so it's beautiful. We have a lot of history. We also have a lot of nature to see. So we are kind of in a neat zone. We're, we're almost um, like we're two areas come together. So we have a lot of diversity, uh, a lot of biodiversity and the birding here is great. So we have hiking, picnicking, biking. Um, we have a birding, um, a bird viewing blind uh, where we have a watering station that's active all year and then through the kind of fall and, and winter, then we put seed out. We do not keep that one stocked with seed all year. We do try to you know, encourage the, the wildlife to go find um, more natural food sources when they are abundant in the spring and summer. But we do feed in the fall and winter and it brings in a lot of really pretty birds. We have beautiful cardinals. I don't know what it is about this area, but our cardinals are just spectacular. Uh, but we also have the junior ranger program so you can come into the office and request a backpack. The backpack has um, field guides, binoculars, um, color like crayons, um, pencil, a journal, um, sketchbook, you know, kind of a guided experience through um, or some some kind of um, some resources for for children to get further into experiencing the outdoors. And then there's a junior ranger booklet that if the kids wanna become a junior ranger, there are activities inside that you can go around the park and complete as you experience the park. Um, it's really popular with kids and parents really appreciate the kind of assisted help, you know, in uh, figuring out what's what's next, you know, what can we go do, what can we go see? Having that booklet um, makes it a, a fun experience for kids and their adults. The trails that we have in our park, um, this one is on the Aranama Nature Trail. Um, the Aranama Nature Trail is about a third of a mile, maybe a quarter, somewhere between a third and a quarter of a mile. Uh, you can see the historic kilns from this site. So there on the side of this picture, that chimney, that is um, part of the kiln that the Civilian Conservation Corps built when they did the restoration of the mission. So um, they built their own kiln right along Kind of to the side there is um, the ruin of the original kiln. So back from when the Spaniards and the Native Americans were building uh, the mission, they had to, of course, build their own kiln too. So you can see both of those kilns, what remains of them uh, from this Aranama Nature Trail. This trail is a very short trail. So, you know, short and sweet. It's my favorite because there's so much to see in such a short distance. But there are stairs. So for mobility, um, issues. There are two sets of stairs down and two sets of stairs up. Um, so keep that in mind. Uh, in the summertime, it's so thickly vegetated that it, there's not a whole lot of, um, su uh, sorry, wind that comes through. Um, it is very shaded, most of it too, but there's not a lot of wind, so it can get pretty hot. Um, so if you are here in the warmer months, definitely this, this is a morning trail to check out. I wouldn't recommend doing it on a hot, sunny afternoon, but it is beautiful to, to check out in the morning. And it is quick. It's, you know, you can easily be, be done with it in 20 minutes, um, but very pretty, relaxing, you know, some wildlife you can see. I've seen foxes down this trail many times, all kinds of birds. Um, it's my favorite. But then we also have the San Antonio River Trail, which is great for biking and, um, as long as it hasn't rained, uh, wheelchairs typically have no problem down this trail, um, at least most of it. There's one part at the end where it's kind of a steep incline, um, but you can duck off of the San Antonio River Trail before that at the, um, the kayak put-in point. So if you don't want to tackle, it's only like a 10-foot piece of trail that goes pretty steep, but that can be hard for wheelchairs. Um, so you can duck off of the trail at the San Antonio uh, River Paddling Trail takeout spot. Uh, but the, the river trail, it's a one mile long trail. It is not a loop. It starts in our picnic area and ends at our Hakali's um, camping area. But it's a nice wide path. Um, again, good for biking, good for families. And it's kind of a leisurely stroll that, that winds uh, right alongside the San Antonio River. So there's plenty of opportunity to kind of peek over and and see the river. 
Um, and of course, a lot of wildlife down there as well. We have um, deer that cross over that trail and all kinds of birds again, um, armadillos, raccoons, you name it, it's down there. Um, and again, the biodiversity down there, if you're into trees, man, I, I love that trail. I'm just kind of looking around and seeing how many different species of tree I can find. Um, then the Angel of Goliad hike and bike trail, that's a paved trail that connects downtown Goliad, downtown with air quotes, because it's a very small town. It's not much of a downtown, but um, it's, it starts very close to the Goliad Square and um, continues through our park all the way out to uh, Presidio La Bahia, and it ends at Fannin Monument. Um, so this trail kind of hits you, or takes you through all the, the high points in Goliad. Um, being paved, again, it's really good for biking and wheelchairs, any kind of mobility issue. Uh, this is a very smooth, um, easy trail to do, um, but it is about two and a half miles, and some of it is shaded, some of it is not, so be prepared for that. Um, definitely bring some water, but it's it's a really neat trail for the community. Um, but, you know, of course, we also encourage everybody who visits our park um, to check out that trail as well. We we love it. It's brand new, like it's just been repaved. So it's nice and smooth and awesome. And here are some of the wildlife that you can see in our park. Um, again, we're kind of a meeting point between two different kind of habitats. So we have some South Texas specialty birds like this green jay that's pictured. We also get um, great kiskadees and some others. Um, the snake in the center there, that's the shot whip snake. We have a lot of lizards and the shot whip snake is a lizard eating snake. Um, we have quite a few snakes in our park. So if you're really, really squeamish, um, stick to those paved trails. Um, but you might, you might see one. We had one this morning um, in one of our bathrooms. So um, most of our snakes are non-venomous. We do have some coral snakes. Um, we really haven't noticed rattlesnakes or um, um, copperheads or water moccasins much in our park. We have mostly coral snakes, which are very shy and other um, snakes that are non-venomous like this shot whip snake. Um, so a lot of reptiles in our park. And then there's pictured the gray fox. Um, that's one of the biggest hits of our park. Um, you don't get to see foxes very often. And we have plenty of foxes in our park. So if you're camping with us and you wanna take a, an evening stroll, um, you very likely could see a gray fox or two. Um, and then we've got turkeys sometimes down in our day use area, our picnic area, um, all kinds of birds, like I said, um, it's a, it's a very neat um, kind of meeting point between two different sections, two different major areas of Texas. The San Antonio River kind of cuts um, between like the South Texas and the central areas. So we get a lot of things that deep South Texas gets and kind of further North. Um, so really awesome biodiversity. And then we have different habitat types, of course. We have open grassland, the riparian, areas that's going to be your your river's edge um, thick hardwoods and um, thick vegetation and then the forest edge is probably where you're going to find most most things um, that's pretty self-explanatory where the forest and the grassland meet um, so with those different habitat types you're going to find different different critters the water recreation uh, we're on the san antonio river we do get asked pretty frequently if we have swimming, you are allowed to swim in the river. We're not gonna tell you that you can't, but we don't generally recommend it because our river is very, pl pr very prone to flooding. And um, with each flood, you know, debris washes down and gets stuck in the riverbed. It's a pretty shallow river. Um, we don't know what's on the bottom, so you know, you jump, jump in that water, we, we just don't know what's, what you might run into, uh, what kind of flood debris might be down there, fishing tackle that broke off, you know, so we just generally don't recommend swimming, um, but we have fishing and we highly recommend paddling. It is a fantastic river um, for paddling. So if you have a kayak, a canoe, bring it, enjoy the river. If you don't have a kayak um, and you'd like to try kayaking, uh, you can contact the Goliad 
um, paddling, tra sorry, the Canoe Trail Goliad. It's called Canoe Trail Goliad. Um, it's run by a man named Wilfred Korth. And um, sometimes he's able to loan out kayaks and, and offer shuttling. And so Canoe Trail Goliad is a great resource in the San Antonio River Authority also. Um, here in the park, we have some rods available to loan through our tackle loaner program. Those are free of cost. You just come in and check them out. Um, but then again, it's a moving river. So if you're fishing top water, if you're fishing with a bobber, it's going to float downstream. So um, we kind of recommend the bottom fishing uh, for this river. So if you're brand new at it, um, just put your put your bait on the bottom and leave it. Wait for a you know, for the fish to come around and grab it. Um, some people get a little frustrated because they're used to bobber fishing. Um, it's just not not fun to bobber fish in this river because it's just going to end up on on the bank downstream. Um, so we recommend bottom fishing, um, and you can catch sunfish, catfish. Um, catfish is the most often uh, fish that's caught in this river, um, and then. I mean, it's just a beautiful place to sit and hang out. So, you know, rod or not, you can sit and watch the river. It's a very peaceful place uh, to be. So this is a new dock. We're really excited about this dock. Um, so come and check it out. <laughs> um, then the Goliad Paddling Trail, we have three put-in points. Um, they actually haven't updated the map yet. So this is what we have right now with the two paddling trail put-ins. But there's a new uh, site the, at Riverdale. So that about triples the length of the float. Uh, so if you go from the uh, Highway 59 spot, where it's about six and a half miles um, from that site down to uh, the park, if you imagine you know, twice more upriver, that's where Riverdale is. So it's, it's a long float from Riverdale. Uh, if you put in at Highway 59, that float takes a few hours. That's a pretty decent float um, for somebody who's relatively experienced with paddling. I would not recommend beginners starting out there. Um, if you are brand new to kayaking or you don't have much time, you don't want to kayak for a long time, then there's the uh, put-in point at Ferry Street, which is close to Branch River Park, and that's a much shorter float. Um, you still get Plenty of wildlife. It's it's beautiful. The whole river is is fantastic, uh, but that is a much shorter, um, like I said, easier for beginners and children. Um, so if you're looking for that shorter float, all the put-in points have really nice um, kind of like metal stairs that go down. Um, hopefully that shows up in the video later, but um, they're really convenient. Um, put in points and then the takeout. I want to make sure that everybody understands that we are the takeout point. If you put in at our park, you're in for a long trip. <laughs> so get out of the river at our park unless you are absolutely prepared for that long, long trip down river. Um, but we have lots of lots of floating activity on a river, and we have the the Goliad paddle. Uh, sorry, Canoe Trail Goliad puts on um, flotillas in the, the fall and the spring. So if you're looking for more of a group activity, maybe you are starting out and you don't wanna do it on your own, check out those flotillas, join them. Um, they get you set up with kayaks. They'll help you get in the water. They'll help you figure out how to operate the kayak and then they'll help you off of the river and shuttle you back. So the flotillas are excellent options for um, beginners and experienced paddlers. Our events, um, we offer programming throughout the year, um, but our biggest program, our most popular one is the Mission History Tour. We offer those um, each weekend on Saturdays and Sundays. We try to keep those at the same time throughout the year, but in the winter time, those tours happen at, at two o'clock. When it gets hot, those programs are now happening at 10 in the morning. So right now, 10 a.m. on Saturdays and Sundays, you can meet us on the porch under those arches and um, we'll go on a mission history tour where we talk about the, the history of obviously the mission, um, 
and uh, kind of what mission life was like uh, here back in the 17, 1800s. And then History and Lights is our biggest single, um, I'm sorry, Rio Rio is the biggest event that we have. That happens the second uh, weekend in November. Rio Rio is a two-day event. On Friday, we bring in school groups and we have up to about 1,200, 1,300 kids come in that day. And then Saturday, we're open to the general public. Uh, Rio Rio is a, a day of reenactment, basically. We have a lot of um, booths that are set up all over the mission grounds where we have different activities going on. Um, we might have blacksmithing, um, leather working, uh, Dutch oven cooking. We like to bring in our archaeologist, our regional archaeologist, and he does a display, um, a little program about uh, layers of the soil, you know, how you uh, how you know how old things are based on where they are in the soil, that kind of thing. Um, we might have San Antonio River Authority come in and talk about river health, um, just all kinds of, of activities and things to learn. Um, some things that are historical in nature and others that are more modern, um, kind of focusing on the more modern recreation of our site. And then history and lights is kind of what's pictured here. Um, this event has changed a little throughout the years, but um, some things that stay the same is it's beautiful. <laughs> we put Christmas light um, loops, you know, in those arches. So the archways are lit up. We have a pathway of um, luminary boxes that will guide you up to the mission. And then you can walk around the mission and see we have cutouts that are lit up that kind of tell the, the story of our park. Um, starting actually with the nativity scene. Um, the nativity scene was started by uh, the Franciscan, it was actually by St. Francis um, himself. So the na first nativity scene, its history is in the Franciscan realm. <laughs> and these were Franciscan priests at our park. So it starts there, it goes into the Native Americans here, and then the ranching community, and then um, kind of there all the way through becoming a state park. So it's it's telling the history of our park in lights. Um, but then we also offer those other programs throughout the year. So uh, we might do at Laddle or CCC programs. We might do nature hikes. Um, you know, we, we kind of run the whole gamut between nature and history. Uh, we try to keep new things on the table. And so you can check back our, at our events uh, page on the TPWD website to see what we have going on. We do try to post those on Facebook as well, but definitely all the information is gonna be on the Texas Parks and Wildlife calendar of events. Okay. All right, so this shows us where our visitors are coming from and how many we have. And so we get about 42,000 visitors in a year. Uh, most of them come from Texas metro areas. Uh, we have quite a few from Corpus, Houston. Um, I know that we have a lot from San Antonio, but that's not specifically listed. So, so we add about $2 million roughly in economic value to our local area here, um, almost 30 jobs with about $42,000 in sales tax. Um, we have 63 overnight sites and uh, about three miles of trail. Um, the uh, Educational contacts, that's, uh, I don't know what was that in 2019. So that one, a large portion of that is actually from Rio Rio, but we contact people all throughout the year. Every single day, we are adding um, several uh, educational contacts. Um, because we have such a large interpretive team, that's all we're doing all day is interacting with guests and sharing our history. All right. Okay, then. Well, we are actually at our hard time of close. So I only have one question. When will water be fixed to the mission ground? We're looking into that. Uh, I do not have any kind of answer um, right now. We're trying to decide which method would least impact the site. So um, no solid plans yet. Um, so we, we do not have the restroom running um, or the water fountain at the mission. And I have no time frame for that, unfortunately. Okay, then. So that was my last question. Thank you, Emily, for showing us your amazing park. Uh, Goliath is wonderful, so rich in history and so rich in nature and beauty.
And thank you again, Emily, for once more doing, for leading this great tour of your park. Everyone else, have a great day. Bye.